Welcome, everyone. I have met with uh, most of you either face to face or uh, virtually, uh, but we also have some like new names in the participants as well. So for those that who do not know me, my name is Ganesh and I'm the marketing manager at Inspire Tech. Thank you for joining us today. I'll, I'll be the moderator. And this is our first Easy Share product deep dive session. And today's topic is going to be secure file exchange methods. And some of you already know him, uh, our Easy Share product manager, Techway. Uh, he will be going deeper into use cases of Easy Share, and we hope it'll be helpful for you. And during the webinar, we will have a poll and then we'll also ask you some questions. So to make it a little bit more interactive and then uh, let's say let's less boring. And then um, after TechBase presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you can ask anything or even just share your uh, customers' experiences with us. And then we can have like a short uh, open discussion. And just to have like a little housekeeping before we get started, I always say this, but like for the ones that are also uh, hearing for the first time, if you use the Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, bar, Zoom bar, and then uh, instead of the chat button, then we make sure we don't miss your questions. And then I'll just start. Because most of you all um, know about EasyShare and uh, they, you, you, you know it really well. So we will not uh, do any generic EasyShare introduction other than just sharing uh, this slide, which is the one sentence that we can, how we summarize EasyShare over and over again, right? So it is a enterprise uh, great file security solution uh, that helps organizations to securely manage, share and govern files. And our motto is at the top of the page as well. So secure thing, share simplified. So just to have some like a subliminal message to your prospects, you can always use these uh, lines. And then let me go to the next slide. So then, as you know, so we are going to be uh, talking about the secure file exchange uh, today, and then we're going to be talking about the protocols behind those as well. So FTP, SFTP, SMB. Uh, let's do one short poll on why do we keep hearing about these protocols, and when was the last time you heard of them? Like, how was it like associated? So, what are those? Uh, names like resonate uh, resonate with you. So let's do the poll. Hang on a second. Okay, so you should see the pop up now. Um, I'll give you like a two minutes, then we'll continue after the vote. Uh, we have like a couple of people left who haven't voted. I'll just wait a little bit more for them. So why are we hearing about these protocols? They are used for file transfers because you heard about like they are linked to potential cybersecurity risks or they are linked to speed of the file transfers, all of the above. Or it might be that you haven't heard of them, which is fine. So that's why we are doing this session also. We're going to be uh, going over uh, the basics and then we're going to see how it's relevant for easy share. I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm ending the poll now. So, yay. From the results that I have, like I can see that most of you have known the answer, which is like all of the above. 
And then uh, these protocols, uh, let me just also open the next slide. So here are some uh, common file protocols um, that we hear about. Like these, these are just like a really uh, tip of the iceberg. Uh, or like we didn't want to put everything in the slide, but like these are the most heard ones. And uh, today, like I said, we're going to be focusing on SMB and SFTP. And uh, all of these protocols are used for uh, file transfers. And Takeway will explain in detail like uh, how they were linked to like a latest like a cybersecurity uh, vulner risks and vulnerabilities. And yes, they are linked to speed of the file transfers as well. So again, if you haven't heard of them, no worries. Uh, after this session, you will know and like you will see how they are relevant for us. And let me go to the next slides. Yes, why do these protocols matter? So what, what is SMB, what is SFTP protocols? And then, um, uh, sorry. And then, like I said, how can we use this topic as a conversation starter with our prospects? And how is it relevant for EasyShare customers? Uh, like I said just now. So with that, I'll leave the stage to Techway. Uh, he'll go through the overview of SMB and SFTP. Then we'll dive into the two specific use cases. And over to you, Techway. Okay, thank you, Gunesh, for the introduction. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, a lot of times uh, for uh, our partners, the question, there's a lot of questions about how Easy Share fits into today's technology trends, and that's why we are doing this now. And given that we focus a lot on file security, file sharing, we thought that the first good topic to talk about is really this thing about file transfer. And not only that, in terms of cybersecurity trends, nowadays it's almost like every day we hear about a uh, certain data leakage issue or data loss issues due to uh, file security things or file sharing things. And that's why it matters to us. Now, before I dive deeper into the topic, I will just have a little bit of a disclaimer because when we curate the content today, uh, it is quite heavily focused on a sort of like on-premise kind of deployment. So uh, as you all would have known, we also embrace cloud and we have a lot of flexibility deployment in deployment mod models as well. But just specifically for today, given the topic that we are talking about, mostly revolving around um, on-premise, including the customers that I'm going to be sharing later. So it might appear that we are a bit like on-premise, but bear in mind that Easy Share, as you all know, is a flexible solution. So we do embrace cloud as well. Now with that, I think um, we want to go a little bit of uh, uh, how do we think of file exchanges here, right? So commonly in, in Inspire Tech here, e Easy Share, right? We look at file sharing uh, in two ways. First, we split it into the internal part. So this is where you work with your colleagues. Typically, you might be within the same network zone. The network might be well protected. And most of the time, there's a lot of collaboration involved. You work on the files together and stuff. And second, you have the external file sharing. So most of the time, it might not be as intensive kind of collaboration you have with your colleagues, but you do have to share some information with, for example, third party vendors or customers and uh, other parties that you might be working uh, due to your business requirements. And with that, uh, why we split this particularly and why we chose the two protocols that Gunesh have highlighted earlier, right? Is exactly because these two common uh, behaviors, user behaviors have actually driven that two protocols. So now the first one on the internal side, right? Uh, that's where SMB was kind of like built to do a lot of, uh, mostly used for internal collaboration. Uh, so how it got started, a lot of organizations were implementing NAS systems uh, into their office environment, primarily to allow colleagues to collaborate internally when they're in office. So this thing really started whereby um, computers start getting more common and there's a need to share files within the office environment. And, 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 and Microsoft is the one that developed this and they, it became very popular and become the standard that we see in a lot of NAS. Of course, the competing one being NFS. Uh, we chose SMB because uh, a lot of our use cases that I'll share later actually came from um, SMB issues. 
Uh, of course, it became very popular because of the uh, increase in popularity of the Windows file, uh, Windows operating system. So SMB works very seamlessly with Windows file, uh, Windows operating system, and that it has kind of like become the default behavior of a lot of users to be very familiar with this sort of like network drives, uh, SMB protocol kind of thing. And third, uh, in recent years, we do see that a lot of organizations uh, when they need to work remotely, what they do is that they pair it with a VPN solution to make it more secure. Uh, however, we do know that there are a lot of issues, for example, a VPN bottleneck and stuff that might not make this the most ideal solution. But for today, uh, the VPN area, uh, we won't be going as deep. But uh, if there's interest to find out more about um, VPN issues of, or like how there are recent trends of VDI, desktop as a service, uh, we will be glad to organize more sessions to share with our partners the trends on these areas as well as some of the technology partners that we have that might offer a solution for your customers as well. Yeah, moving on next, right, in contrast, right, we have the SFTP. So this protocol is used very commonly when we talk about external file sharing. That means uh, your organization with an uh, external third party. Uh, it is commonly confused with this other term called FTPS, which is actually just FTP with SSL. Uh, it is used uh, in a certain extent, but uh, in our experience, SFTP is um, more popular and it requires the use of SSH keys. And it's actually a different thing from FTPS. So sometimes people are confused by this, but actually it's a different thing. Uh, often used to send large file because uh, like same problem that EasyShare is also trying to solve, which is that there's a large attachment, you can't do it via email. And then after that, uh, this is sort of like um, in the older days, the, the solution to this problem. And it is actually very secure. I mean, it has the encryption and cryptographic built into it and it use SSH key pairs and stuff. So the security is definitely there. And so this is a little bit of background of both the protocols. Now, um, when we see it, right, why why uh, we build EasyShare and address? Because we find that there are certain drawbacks of these two protocols that sort of like needed a little bit of value adding enhancements to it. And so in order to understand uh, how EasyShare comes of value to your customers, right, there is a little bit of understanding on like some of the risks and drawbacks of these protocols. So for example, like SMB, they have definitely been in a limelight because they're often featured during ransomware issues. Uh, to be fair, it's kind of most of the time, it's not exactly um, due to sort of like a mistake of how Microsoft is building this protocol and, or like this protocol is that what happens normally is that because SMB is very flexible and very uh, convenient. What I mean, if you ask some of your customers, uh, you will notice that uh, they will know, they will have users actually storing Microsoft Access databases, running all those little mini mini databases off the file system itself. Definitely not really the best practice, but we do see a lot of organizations doing so. And for some of the more sophisticated users, they actually develop their own program and run the executable files on the file system itself. So it, this convenience to users make users really love this um, network drives, SMB file experiences. But at the same time, this is also the reason why when there's a malicious kind of executable being in the system, it is so easily uh, sort of like executed. And then after that, like just started encrypting all the files and all these ransomware issues come. So it, it's, kind of like the, the dilemma between security and convenience such that this protocol is also trying to balance with. And, and increasingly, we do see that due to sort of like this uh, ease of executing these uh, programs that ransomware always have an opportunity uh, attacking this uh, sort of NAS uh, SMB protocol. The second thing is uh, very commonly um, there is a messy permission 
Now, this is by no fault of the protocol itself because the, the design has uh, just allowed users to be able to be flexible. But uh, in reality, what we see at our customer side is that often this thing is not controlled well enough. So when it's not controlled well enough, um, the permission starts to be messy, starts to have a lot of legacy issues. You don't know whether to remove the permission or to, to, to actually, uh, how to actually review this permission. Now, in the event that if a particular uh, user account uh, need access to a file, but he doesn't have access due to the mess, that is still fine. But a lot of risk comes when a user who is not supposed to have access to the file, but due to the mess that um, the administrators are unable to clean it up, they actually have access to certain sensitive files. And many times, again, this becomes the loopholes or the risk that some of all these files get, get um, leaked. So definitely, uh, it's not the fault of the NAS nor the SMB. It's just that the nature of how the technology is and how some organizations have adopted this technology that uh, created all these chances for malicious actors to actually attack um, these systems. Now, on the other hand, on the FTP side, um, it's actually very secure. So um, now the drawback is it does require a certain level of technical competency. Now for most of us, perhaps it's actually no big deal because we are familiar with technology uh, to create the SSH keys, to manage them, to control the access. To us, it's intuitive because we are trained to do so. But increasingly, we have also seen that people with such skill sets um, are getting lesser and lesser by virtue because um, there are other things that um, technically trained people are doing and um, administering this kind of system is just no longer the value adding chain into the business environment. And linking to this is also that um, in order to have certain additional features such as like view only sharing offered by EasyShare and some link expiry, there is a certain level of coding required um, definitely, I wouldn't say it's advanced coding, but let us think of ourselves as our customers being uh, sort of a more layman kind uh, to actually set up the system and use the system, maintain and administer uh, with the, we all of us know that there's this tech talent crunch and all these things going on. So some, uh, for some organizations, it has become a headache to maintain this system, which I will also share more details in our specific use cases later. Now that's the introduction about the protocols that has been established. Fast forward to 2021, actually um, we no longer hear a lot of um, uh, sort of like details of this kind of tools actually. Increasingly, a lot of people are talking about um, Dropbox. Google Drive, WeTransfer, OneDrive, and this sort of like what I call as like cloud solutions, right? Which are definitely, uh, they add value in their own rights because they are very easy to use. The whole user interface is very modern, um, browser-based uh, with a lot of additional cool features with regards to sharing and multiple other controls being built inside, which the sort of older protocols like SMB and SFTP do not uh, have. Next, they also uh, help organization embrace uh, BYOD and remote work experiences um, due to the nature of their design. So this actually makes it very easy for collaboration with both the internal and the external parts. So both use cases actually um, very well supported by these solutions. Now the question is then, um, why do we see that, especially in these regions, right, some of these solutions are not fully embraced? Okay, and it really comes down to this idea of um, data sovereignty, data privacy. So in SMB and SFTP case, a lot of the times these systems are on-premise within the controls of the organization. However, uh, in some of these modern tools, uh, they tend to lose a little bit of control. So for less sensitive files and for uh, sort of like uh, most of the files that are okay to go public, right? Uh, organizations are very ready to go on the cloud. And we also at Inspire Tech, right, we fully appreciate the value that cloud brings to the picture as well. 
Now, at the same time, the organizations such as those that we specifically recommend to target, right, like government sector, um, financial services and stuff, they tend to be more well, more regulated and they have a concern of data sovereignty given that there were high profile cases whereby um, this sometimes this cloud solutions due to their um, vulnerabilities, some of the data get lost or there are also cases like due to legal frameworks, right? Um, jurisdictions whereby these companies are in is able to request these companies to release data to uh, an external government. So this really creates a lot of issues behind these solutions. And increasingly, we see a lot of government starts tightening around this concept. And the trends really just prove so because uh, in Europe, there is GDPR. And then in Malaysia, there's also the Personal Data Protection Act. And in Singapore itself, we also do have the Personal Data Protection Act. Over at India and Indonesia, uh, I understand I last, the last I checked, it's not in the law yet, but the bill is definitely heavily being discussed and uh, it's with almost certainty that this bill will pass and that organizations will have to um, look at this area. At the moment in this region, yes, we do see that um, the kind of awareness and the kind of like urgency in terms of putting in controls and processes to protect data is not as strong as what uh, we might see in the US and Europe. But in terms of trends when we see in future, right, it's definitely the way to go because um, the governments today, they are just uh, allowing organizations to have sort of this transition time to move over. So for example, in Singapore, when the act was first introduced, the penalties are not that high and the scope and requirements are not as high as what we see in the US and the Europe side. But just this year, they already um, updated the act to increase the fine, increase the penalty, increase the scope. So I will also see that in Malaysia, Indonesia and India, the governments will slowly tighten it up. The only reason why they aren't tightening at the moment is really to give businesses and organizations that briefer, that time to adapt to the requirements of such uh, legal rules. So um, that is also the reason why we, EasyShare started focusing on file sharing and increasingly now we focus more on file security and putting security at the core of what we are doing here at InspireTech as well. Now, so you, you see that the solutions do have like, sort of like, you have the SMB, SFTP folks, right? Who refuse to use the cloud solutions due to the uh, data sovereignty issues that are involved and they want the control. And then at the same time, you also have organizations seeing that, hey, actually the, the sort of like um, Google Drive, Dropbox solutions is very nice to use. The experience seems to be a bit better than what they have in SMB and SFTP, but then they don't really want to put their data onto the cloud because um, some of these are very, very sensitive, very confidential data that they are just not comfortable putting there. And 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 I think the gist of this whole thing coming forming the picture right, is that uh, the customers that are stuck in this particular area is the one that. Um, Easy share is really um, built for. So, um, yeah, especially like Google Drive, a lot of times as consumers, we are fine using it because um, it's not like corporate sensitive data. But when you talk about like government related data, especially like we have customers uh, that deals with, for example, like the land transport, things like MRT plans, where exactly the train station will be. All these are very sensitive information that once released to public has impact on like property prices, land prices, and, and all these um, delicate matters. So the niche that we, come, we see is that when customers want control over their data, and then they are appreciating that they want that kind of like modern file sharing experiences, right? Um, they identify with EasyShare a lot, and that's the, really the group that um, we add most value to the, the kind of customers that we, we help best. And with that, I think um, the best thing to really explain this is to use our customer's example. So similarly to what I've started just now, I'm going to have 
uh, one case that is based on uh, internet inter internal collaboration use case that will be on the SMB side. And then on the other side is actually an external file sharing kind of use case, which is like FTP, SFTP replacement. So in these use cases, right, I'm sure you have seen this before. So the first is the National Heritage Board. So this is a government entity in Singapore that manages the museums. And what they have is that a uh, number of like um, details as to some of the archive records, archival records. They also deal with um, government archivals. So some could be classified items that they are archiving. So definitely um, some sensitive items involved as well. So this is the slide that we actually use for our generic easy slide, easy share slides that uh, you would have already seen. Now, what I would like to do is to just dive a little bit deeper. So overall, in this case, it's that this uh, customer was actually using the SMB, so the NAS kind of environment. And the immediate challenge they have is that the government banned this SMB, right? So coming deeper, right, their challenge is that they were using this SMB, quite satisfied, and everything was all right until the government of Singapore decided to <clears throat> ban this protocol. And I think the... The essence is not so much, oh, because the government banned, so that's why I don't use it. I think it is important to understand why they ban it. So first thing is that um, there were a lot of vulnerabilities that kept coming out. Um, and these vulnerabilities were always widely publicized. And whenever they get publicized, uh, attacks always happen. And in particular, it's usually always ransomware attack and then the files get encrypted. Uh, that's that's why it's called data loss, because you lose access to your data. So threat actors always exploit this, and they really love to exploit this because they know that many organizations are still using this protocol, which is also the reason why there are a lot of um tools that kind of like uh have this uh ransomware protection coming up as well, because um like as I mentioned, it's not really just the fault of the protocol itself. It's just that. Um, in terms of the execution and then the files being readily, the executable files being readily run from the file system itself and, and, and these things just happen. And at the same time, they were also exploring about remote working use case. So having their users uh, being able to access this internal files um, during out of office. So previously they um, were having difficulties in doing so. So they were unable to collaborate. Now, uh, with the implementation of Easy Share, right? What we did is that we have that additional layer of platform, and and we use the HTTPS protocol. Of course, um, it's not just the protocol; it's sort of the design of the program itself, and including our three tier architecture, the differentiating of the web tier, app tier, and the database, and some of the other details that we have put in, in terms of our architectural design and how the ports opening, all these things have to come into picture, but I know virtue is that it's just because of easy share. What we come in is also that we have an analysis of the customer's environment, intranet, internet, design the whole solution and offer it. And I think that's why the point is that when selling easy share, right, it's, it's this solution is not just that, okay, I give you this solution and it's done. There is a lot of value adding that we can offer to our customers with regards to understand their file security risk, where are the areas that um, things could get wrong, and then to provide them with a solution. So it's not just a software selling, it's really a solution selling that we are doing here. And as you all know, with the fact that EasyShare is being deployed as a solution, they have that flexibility to use our desktop web clients to access the files even um, during out of office. And next, I move on to the case that I talk about. So that's all for the internal side. Now we talk about the replacement of a SFTP. So this is with our Singapore Central Bank. They have a use case to exchange uh, large files with other banks. So they were actually using uh, SFTP. So you all might have seen this slide before. I will jump a little bit deeper. Uh, there are pain points that the uh, process owner was having, right? First, uh, in, in their SFTP system, they felt that there was a lack of 
uh, audit and traceability. Yes, we as technically trained personnel, we do know that it is possible to build some sort of programs to have that audit logging capability in SFTP. But um, at a point in time, they, they do not really have that priority to really build this thing. Like why, why, why does the customer want to build this thing on themselves? Like they really just want the solution to it. Um, next, they were also having operational issues, for example, like new users coming in and they need to share file, they need to request for an account, then after that they need to create the, the key pairs and they need to manage others and, and when it's small it's just okay and when it gets bigger it's just getting more and more difficult to manage. And third, um, there, there was also no ways to really verif uh, verify the receiving party. So sometimes the SSH key could be just uh, passed to the wrong person and then or like the accounts just get passed around. So maybe you share it with the auditors and then the auditors pass to another 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 personnel, the senior pass to the junior and that kind of thing. And it's, it's just uh, troublesome to sort of like manage that whole process here. So they were looking for a solution and that's where we come in as well. Again, uh, as you all know, the audit log that we have, very comprehensive, very easy to read. And that is something that um, this customer um, saw the value in. And secondly, with our central admin portal, right? Um, they are now able to do that whole um, operationally manage all this um, creating new user accounts, tracking the permissions and files via the admin portal. And third, with regards to the external verification, they, they actually use our one-time PIN verification, so that mobile verification to ensure that the recipient is uh, verified before having access to the files. Yeah, and that's uh, all from my part. So um, at this moment, I really just gave a very high level because I also want to leave sufficient time for the Q&A. So if there's a lot, uh, there's some questions want to drive deeper about uh, how those use cases went and like why our customers are seeing value and using this system in their day-to-day -day operations. Right? I think that's where I pass it over to Gunesh to facilitate our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Takeway. So uh, I think it summarized everything like uh, really well. So we have uh, two questions. So let me read it out. In the meantime, like uh, you can write your questions. Then we can also ask back some questions to you too. Um, let me hang on. Can we make it all work? Sorry, this is a long question. So I also need to read. Take my D mind also reading from your side. I'll just read it out loud. So thank you, uh, Indra. Uh, so about collaboration, when we need to access one file for collaboration, EasyShare have a feature check-in, check-out. How can we make a collaboration and meet the requirements? I think uh, we need a bit more information. Take me, uh, no, yeah, Ganesh, I got it. Because this is the mm, one okay. that our customers always complain about. Uh, I agree. Uh, this is a bit of a tough call. Um, we are still seeing the demand. Um, our stand comes from because um today uh, most of our use cases revolves around um the need to really track who changed the file. The e we do not have a technical limitation. In fact, if we want to allow this co-editing, we call this co-editing, Gunashi is the co-editing oh, oh, okay, right? the, the one that we always argue about. So uh -huh. uh, technically, there's no reason why it can't be implemented. The only sort of like uh, other side of the way that we look at it is more because uh, we built this solution, putting in important focus to track who exactly make what changes. And when in co-editing mode, right, what we notice is that the version history will increase a lot. And it, it while it's still traceable, it is definitely a little bit more messy and a little bit harder to trace exactly who is making changes because so many users are making changes at the same time. It's very hard to say that, oh, like, oh, I didn't touch it. It was Gunesh who changed this part. So, so I mean, um, 
So for our use cases, it tends to be more towards that. And this is a very good question. We list on to another part, which is the one that I asked Gunesh to organize. I think I think we can get feedback to see whether uh, our partners are interested in this topic because we get a lot of questions of like, oh, my customer has Microsoft Teams. They do not need another solution. Now uh, with that, right, we do actually have a response to that. And it actually links to why we design it this way. Uh, we have we see that there are a lot of solutions that already do co-editing. Now it's just how do we segregate the use cases and to to design the solution such that uh, it fits in. So I think for that we will we can organize another session to share with you more details about like how some of our customers right do have multiple systems. For example, one for that kind of co-editing, real-time collaboration cases, and then after that using Easy Share to actually do the proper fouling do the proper checking that needs to be traced. And then after that, some even have an archival system to do proper archival process. And then after that, there will be... So um, the gist of it is that we always go based on use cases. And in fact, just because a customer has one solution already doesn't mean that they, they have no need for easy share. It really... Uh, we really do have a, a few cases whereby um, due to the different use cases, Oh, the other one that I missed out was backup. So there's some that they use it for backup. Some we have customers that use EasyShare just for backup without the collaboration. So it's really that understanding of, and and that is what is driving us to really run this for our partners because this area of file security and file exchanges, while it sounds easy, after I work with many customers, I realized that there are a lot of scenarios that we might not have think of as a user that um, if you think for me from an organizational security and process point, uh, it has a lot of deep thoughts that we have to go into. So hope, hope that answers the questions. And I think Gunesh, maybe we can also do one with regards to this collaboration cases of like how we how we use Teams, even ourselves, how we mix using Teams and Easy Share at the same time and then share that experience in future. Yeah, definitely. Because like, I mean, we are also the users of Easy Share, right? And also Teams, like in this case, like uh, what you mentioned. So the collaboration, uh, I think it, it, it works with more accountability in EasyShare, uh, just to add on to the tech based thing. So like uh, after you edit, then I will edit. So like who, yep, yep, yep. That was you know, the word. who edits uh, what, right? <laughs> yeah, we always so, discuss that. Yeah, the keyword that we always use is the accountability. It, it, the accountability <laughs> part tends to be a bit lesser, harder to control in that co-editing situation. Yeah, true, mm. true. So then we do have a couple of more questions. Is EasyShare compatible with all legacy and new technology? Oh, I think it's a good question for oh, yeah. to talk about our integrations. Yes. Right, correct. So actually linking back to the SMB use case, sure. uh, one of the additional pain point was that sometimes customers do not want to migrate out of their SMB. So what we do is that like, um, they have a NAS ready. So, so today when ransomware happens, right, what happened is uh, the port, the SMB port is being opened in the entire network, which really that is the reason why it allows ransomware to, to, to come out. And what we, what we do is that uh, we have customers that what happened, they block all the SMB ports such that it's only accessible by EasyShare. Still a little bit of risk there, but because uh, it's, uh, no human can go in to trigger a program from being run. The risk is much lower. And then they have that easy share interface now to work with their files. And then just to answer the question, so we actually complement sort of like legacy technology. And in the same time, our storage connectors, we connect to cloud storages as well. So we have customers that they have certain kind of data that due to legacy is really on premise. They use um, sort of like maybe the uh, 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 their NAS. And then after that, uh, on another hand, there are certain type of data they want to store in object storage because they value the availability and the scalability in the object storage part. But they don't want to manage it separately, right? They want to have a single interface, right? And that's why they connect into EasyShare. So I think in summary, to really answer the question, right, is that EasyShare is uh, maybe not compatible with all legacy and all new technology, but we are definitely compatible with um, the industry sort of like uh, common protocols and technology, including like Microsoft Azure, 
S3 connectors. Uh, we also connect to SMB actually and web dev and stuff. So yep, that is the that that um part that we offer in EasyShare as well. Mm -hmm. Then I go to the next question. Um, I think you mentioned this a little bit just now. What about on-premise to cloud file transfer? Is this supported by EasyShare? So with the connectors that you mentioned, maybe just summarize yeah. it one more time for this okay. a question. Sure. So this question, actually, I actually see from two, two perspectives, you see. There are some people who are doing an on-premise to cloud migration. So in terms of transfer, it could be a migration. And I have customers, right, what they do is that they actually don't really want to migrate. Because what happens is that they have all this old data, right, whereby they know that after five years later, it's no longer going to be relevant. So what they do is that they enter into this hybrid mode. They put their on-premise connected to EasyShare, and then they also connect sort of like a cloud storage onto EasyShare. And moving on, they want to be on cloud. It's just that they don't want to spend the effort to do a migration because knowing that maybe three to five years later, they no longer need it. And it's just part of the data life cycle management. So what they do is that they connect both on and they tell users that your on-premise one is only going to be read only. So they make it only read only so that no new things can go inside it. And what they do is that if the users feel that they have files that they will need it in future, they will have to gradually migrate and copy and then move to the cloud side of the storage or rather to the users, it's just called new storage. And then gradually over time, they just do this. They don't have to spend a lot of effort to do migration and all the cost that is and all the pain that's involved. They can gradually move to a cloud, cloud kind of environment, yet still preserving what they have on-premise seamlessly. And then um, um, they, they proceed on there. So that, that is one scenario. And there's another type is that they, they their use case is that they want a migration. That means they immediately they want to decom their on-premise storage really. Uh, when that comes right then, I would say that's not so much a use case for easy share. That is more for our other product, which I think some of our partners here might not be aware yet. That is called Giga Central. So Giga Central, we call it uh, uh, as in like a cloud data management solution. We, we position them more as a data management solution that helps with some of these migration use cases. So, so again, as you can see, right, what we focus here is a lot about use case and the purpose. And then we, 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 we apply the technology and solution to the problem as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then we have received more and more questions. So, um, you want to take the SharePoint one. So is EasyShare directly competing with SharePoint? The functions and feature looks the same. Ah, yep, yes. So that one we uh, have another session definitely, but for yeah, like deeper, we should drive deeper. this in because mm -hmm. this is really that 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 sort of like this this must be the key questions that our partners have been getting from our customers. And, and anyway, we also get them uh, equally in in high volume as well. Uh, the answer is really yes and no. Um, yes, in a sense, definitely in terms of tools, right? Uh, the features are similar. Um, I would say um, much less similar. And in fact, I think um, it's a compliment to us, right? Given that SharePoint is developed by uh, MNC with uh, huge resources involved and us being small, we are able to deliver a quality product that is on par with sort of um, what Microsoft has developed. And that um, we always take pride in our team's um, engineering efforts to, to build. Now, uh, what is different is that um, SharePoint is not a connector. SharePoint can't allow you to sort of like um, natively sort of um, link to the uh, S3 or object storage because uh, when you upload files into the document library in the SharePoint, it's their native database. There's a limited flexibility around there. You can have uh, additional add-ins and additional enhancements, but then again, that requires additional efforts and stuff, not, not something that's natively provided like what EasyShare provides. Some other differences, uh, like in terms of audit logs, uh, SharePoint will also tell you that they have audit logs, but you can check with any SharePoint customers and see whether can they give you answers like for a particular user, what are all the files and all the storage spaces that they have most of the time you can't do it in you can't do it as easily unless you know how to run some of the PowerShell scripts. 
which becomes a problem for some customers who do not have that kind of competency. And it becomes the reason why you will notice that there is a lot of uh, vendors that sell solutions to help you clean up your SharePoint permission. So it links a little bit of the SMB permission issue that I talked about. Like if you notice that in the market, right, there are solutions that are being sold to clean up SharePoint and, and some of these permissions, right? It means to show that um, the solution um, does have some of these inherent issues. I wouldn't criticize it as a bad thing because uh, I fully understand the design of why it needs to be flexible and and what is the design purpose into it. It's just that in reality, there are customers that end up with a sort of a bit of a mess. And then after that, you see some of these vendors coming out with tools and to solve this problem and 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 yeah and I could probably go much more on and I guess that's why we probably have to curate this into another <laughs> session will. next time. Then. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly because that that really uh, I think it needs more than just like uh, only a few minutes to go over like uh, oh yeah you know what these are the differences and then just be done with it like that that one we can really have another session and. Um, I'm looking at the next question. Um, can EasyShare have different database solution? Um, is this clear uh, enough for you or? I think I think I know it. I, said, mm -hmm. I think it's our backend, the one that we are using Microsoft okay. SQL. Uh -huh. So um, um, we are monitoring the request because for us, it will take a, sort of a bit quite severe engineering effort to put it on. Uh, maybe I just share a little bit more on, more on why we started off with Microsoft. Because when we work with some of our government customers, they 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 wanted a sort of like a supported, so 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 we can't use like MySQL because it's sort of like it's open source. They wanted to have a solution that is uh, um supported by a vendor. Then of course I do see that uh, we all know that the trends have changed. So we are looking out and see, uh, what is the demand coming out from here? Uh, I know one of the key reasons is because of the cost, but at the same time I believe that. Um, Microsoft will have will evaluate their business model and based on the competition, they, they, they will come with this. So for, for to answer the question, as of this moment, unfortunately, we will only be on Microsoft SQL, but we are observing the trends of whether SQL costs, how it will move. And we are also monitoring how organizations are receptive to other kind of databases because some of the more frontier kind of organizations they don't mind but for some they do still want something like uh, microsoft sql in fact actually microsoft sql has been very aggressive they have been crawling a lot of oracle database clients as well um so we will monitor and see the use case because uh, our for our inspired tech business evaluation uh, embracing a new database would mean additional effort and that will also translate to pricing decisions, which uh, does impact on our business side of things as well, in terms of our pricing as well. Mm -hmm. Then I think we still have time for a couple of more questions because we do have questions, which is awesome. Yeah, and totally. yeah, good, good. So like uh, then uh, we will definitely have like a uh, more sessions like this. So there is one question. Let me just read it out loud, but. Uh, I don't think we can go deep in that one, but we can have another section for that, which is what is the comparison between Google Drive and old uh, 365? Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that we can do like a whole session with the like a competitor, uh, maybe differentiation. And then the next one I will ask is, what is the most popular use case for EasyShare that you have deployed? Oh, this I is think that's easy. It. Now, this is easy because the reason why we started with this SMB replacement and SFTP replacement use case is because that is the most common one. That means um, there were uh, companies that wants to enhance their internal collaboration systems. So they could be on a NAS or actually I also have customers who are on on-premise SharePoint. Why I kept say, saying all the stories about SharePoint because I hear so much from the customer that I hear the pain that they have go through in terms of size exploding or like the permission is in a mess. And then after that, it's all these things that, uh, then after that, they replace it with easy share. So the, the sort of like internal collaboration use case, replacing whatever they have internally. In fact, easy share does replace SharePoint as well. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's due to sort of like SharePoint is very bad and stuff. It's just uh, 
certain scenarios, um, SharePoint uh, wasn't able to support for that particular customer. Then we then we come in as a replacement, and then after the SMB replacement, I explain, and then SFTP replacement. So, uh, in fact, we have another customer. They they don't they didn't really use SFTP. They have an in house build. So I'm sure. All of us technical people, right? We know that in the past, people like to build in-house. So even this kind of external file sharing solution, this customer probably like maybe 10, 15 years ago, engaged a team to build a solution for this external file sharing. And then after that, um, same story, right? Nobody maintained it. And then after that, it got obsolete and then it become flagged out as a security concern. And then customer has to look for another solution and they found us and then we replace it. So the top two most common kind of use cases is this kind of replacement. But in in terms of reaching out and finding out this this kind of use cases, right? Uh, I do see the challenges because it requires you to know the exact person that is in charge of this particular system, which um, may be difficult to navigate in large organizations. And then it is also like you really need to have the insights to know um, that a legacy file sharing system is being used because sometimes this this system might not be used by the entire organization. It might be used by a certain group of department which has large files. So those are the places where the opportunities are. But uh, the good thing is that the opportunities are there. The sort of like more challenging thing is that it requires us to have that navigation to find out um, who in this whole organization is in charge and requires this solution. So, yep, if I will share some of our experiences there. Yep, Ganesh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe let's take one last question. So, um, also like uh, there is uh, no name. So if you can just like type us your name, then we can get back to you for the uh, questions that we couldn't answer now. Um, so this one is, I have multiple sites. Can I deploy EasyShare to one site while connecting to all other sites? They are using Synology NAS and company policy dictates that file share needs to be sent via HQ site. Yes, definitely. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, um, okay, then this indirectly answer our differences with other solutions. So we, we connect to storages. So unlike some other solutions that don't allow you to have the flexibility to choose storage. So I give you an example. If you use Google Drive, there's no way you can control where Google stores the, the file. It's, Google says it's here, it's here. Google says it's there, it's there. You, you, you are not the one that's going to control it. So for Easy Share, you can deploy Easy Share to the HQ site and then you connect to sort of the other sites. In, and, and then Easy Share being that central place to control, meaning you you probably if, if let's say assuming this is an external file sharing use case or that, that's why if going into details right it, it goes back to um, port blocking and some of the controls that revolves around that but uh, the quick answer to that is yes we do support such use cases the only additional thing i thought i want to highlight is that um, usually in such use cases the concern is the bandwidth of the remote office so um uh, that might be a concern, but no worries. Uh, uh, we have our solutions that can come in as well. So in certain use cases, like I said, Giga Central is actually built to solve some of these problems. And depending on where are the locations and what exactly is the pain point, right? Uh, some of the some of the problems could be solved by our partner solutions that also dwell with this, like what we call robo, right? Remote office, branch office use case because we do we do see a lot of organizations they have branches uh for now right we hear that their pain point is that uh, each branch manage their own things i don't know what happened there uh if somehow that the site get breached right it, it will be just be like i don't know because i so difficult for me from singapore to go and manage whatever that is down there and we do see also uh, customers are trying to see how they can centrally manage yet at the same time overcome some of these uh, latency bandwidth issues and from a technology end, I observed that, yeah, increasingly this this uh there are a lot of solutions that are coming out to to solve some of these challenges as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Techway. I I mean we are reaching the end of the time, so uh like I said, if you send us your name, that we will get back to you on the uh rest of the stuff, and we will make sure that uh you know 
when we are having the next session on the other uh, competitor differentiator uh, session that we're gonna have. Uh, we had some questions to ask you, but uh, since we are like uh, out of time, I'll just like, uh, uh, I, because we wanted to know like, have you used SFTP before? How was the experience? And then, so what are the common file sharing solutions that your customers or prospects are using? And then what are the some questions that are posed by your customers to you? So uh, these questions, I think we'll just send you an email, maybe if you can share with us uh, or next session when we have the ask me anything session, then we, we can discuss like, a, uh, we are planning to do it like a, by talking. Like, so then it will not be like, a, uh, it will be less one way. So that, will, that one will be a little bit more um, uh, smaller groups that we are planning. Um, so let me continue from this. Um, thank you so much for all of the questions and uh, all of the uh, stuff that you write, you wrote just now. A uh, couple of things like uh, that I wanna highlight before we end today's session. Uh, if you didn't know that we have a YouTube channel and where you can find like a lot of short product videos, like one minute videos, really short tutorials, and we do have our past uh, webinar recordings as well. So like uh, here is the uh, uh, integration with uh, other products that we have. And yeah, these are the old webinars that we had, easy share tutorials and these product videos, I think they're gonna be really useful. Uh, it just gives like a really quick um, summary of what easy share is, uh, how it helps. I think it might give like a really good um, ammunition to support your, uh, support your um how to say <laughs> support you in general yeah and then we will be sharing the link of the uh, this also in the chat uh, yeah, I think so Vanessa, you can, we, we yeah. did all this because uh easy share is really like in this whole cyber security ecosystems and that's why yeah. the partner video series is really just to sort of like um build all the solutions to have a more comprehensive cyber security solution that's why that is something that we, we exactly. wish our partners to strive towards too because just selling software just selling hardware we all know that the margins are getting lower in future it's really a lot about providing that value-added service and providing mm -hmm. a consultancy to our customers on the security end and for us it's definitely the file security side of things yeah so that's why it might help also to watch you uh, watch the other uh partner products that we integrate, then it, then the, there's like more opportunity to do like a upsell, cross sell, and then uh, yeah, then we grow together, right? So this is the story, like a super short story. Actually the story is super long, but like, <laughs> I'll just uh, tell you the gist. So there are two salesmen uh, that they, they send to the, uh, let's say India now, and then um, they are the shoe salesmen. And, um, they have been sent to uh, to do a research uh, to assess the market. Then both of them scout uh, for a few days, then they both contact their uh, HQ. So one of them says, oh, you know what? It was disaster, like nobody wears shoes. And then the other one says, you know what? Nobody wears shoes. It's like, a, that is a glorious opportunity. So that also works with, uh, they are all wearing shoes. So you can just change the uh, topic there. Oh yeah, okay. One of them can say, that is not an opportunity, but like the other one can say, oh yeah, that is a really awesome opportunity. So that's why uh, to find the glorious opportunity, like together, we are doing, uh, we are, we're gonna be doing more of these sessions. So we are here to support you. And for that, that is the ask me anything session that we're gonna have. Uh, again, please uh, fill out the form that we're going to be sending out so then we can decide. I mean, from the questions, I think we have some ideas on what to do next, like uh, immediate next. Uh, but at least we can put it in the pipeline of what's going to come after the those sessions. So um, it would work best for this session to uh, be more successful. Uh, whatever you got from here today, just test it out maybe try it on some prospects and then see uh, what kind of conversations you can actually get out of this. And then if you have questions after that, uh, we'll be here uh, to answer your questions. And I think, yes, we will send you the link and then this is the end of the uh, webinar. And our first product deep dive session, thank you so much for being with us. And 
let me see the and thank you so much for staying until the end like i i we, we do appreciate it and then um let me see yeah i want to thank you like one by one uh, but it is a long yes <laughs> so we'll we'll see you soon and hopefully in the next uh, two weeks uh we'll let you know exactly when we are doing these sessions if we are going to do like a little bit smaller groups uh we'll let you know also thank you so much thank you takeaway also no problem thank you yeah have a lovely day and have a good weekend almost almost weekend it's thursday <laughs> yeah i see you're in weekend mode now <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone bye bye